This is the Cambridge IGCSE Biology paper talked through and it's paper six, the alternative to practical from June 22. A student investigated the effect of temperature on the diffusion of vitamin C. Vitamin C is an important part of a balanced diet and is found in some fruits and vegetables. When vegetables are boiled in water, the vitamin C diffuses out into the surrounding water. A dialysis tubing bag filled with vitamin C solution was used to represent a vegetable. The blue dye DC pip was used as an indicator for the presence of vitamin C. High concentrations of vitamin C decolorize DC pip. The student uses the method described in steps 1 to 14. A syringe was used to fill a dialysis tubing bag with 10 cm cubed of vitamin C solution. The outside of the filled dialysis tubing bag was rinsed by dipping it into a beaker of distilled water. A large test tube was labelled hot. The dialysis tubing bag was put into the large test tube and secured in place with an elastic band. Steps 1 to 3 were repeated with a second dialysis tubing bag and a large test tube labelled cold. So we can really see the thing we're changing, so our independent variable is the temperature. The large test tube labelled hot was half filled with hot water. The large test tube labelled cold was half filled with cold water. The temperature of the water in the largest test tube labelled hot was measured. The temperature of the water in the large test tube labelled cold was measured. Figure 1.2 shows the readings on the thermometer. State the temperatures of the hot water and cold water. So make sure you read this nice and accurately. It goes from 35, 36, 37, 38. So that's 38.5. What about cold water? 15, 16, 17 degrees. And we've included the all important unit. The dialysis tubing bags were left in the large test tubes for 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, the dialysis tubing bags were removed from the large test tubes and discarded. One centimeters cubed of the liquid remaining in the large test tube labeled hot was put into a clean standard test tube. A syringe was filled with the DC PIP solution. One drop of DC PIP was added to the liquid in the standard test tube and swirled to mix. And after a few seconds, the blue color disappeared. Remember, that's testing for vitamin C. The student continued to add drops of DC pip until the blue colour remained after mixing. Steps 10 to 13 were repeated, but this time using the test tube labelled cold. The unused volumes of DC pip remaining in the syringes are shown. So, much less DC pip remains with the hot, which probably means that we had more vitamin C here because. If there was more vitamin C, it would need more DC pip to decolorize. We called the volumes of the DC pip remaining in the syringes. Okay, so we're looking at this quantity here. That's 6.5. What about the cold one? That's more straightforward. That's 9. Prepare a table to record the volume of DC pip that was used in each test tube in the space provided. Use your answers for 1a part 2 in the equation to calculate the volume of DC pip that has been used in each test tube. So what are the test tubes called? Although they didn't explicitly ask for a unit here, I hate putting a results table without a unit, so I'm going to put centimetres cubed here. Now be careful, remember it's to do with what was used. So we started with 10, we had left 6.5, so what was used was 3.5. We started with 10, what we had left was 9, so we had 1 remaining. State a conclusion for these results. Now because a lot more DC pip was used up in the hot situation, that means there was a lot more vitamin C diffusing out of the inside of the visking tube and that's because diffusion occurs faster at higher temperatures. So just why the dialysis tubing bag was rinsed in step two. That's in order to ensure that there's no contamination by vitamin C or to remove any vitamin C that's stuck to the outside of the tubing.
Identify one source of error in step five or step six and suggest a suitable piece of equipment to overcome this error. So we're looking here. It's all very imprecise. We really, really need to use a measuring cylinder, burette, graduated pipette syringe, anything like that here because we haven't measured the volume properly. Identify the variable that the student changed and the variable that was measured. So what they changed was the temperature. And remember what they measured was the volume of DC PIP. Suggest why repeating the procedure several times would improve the investigation as it would improve the reliability and help you identify anomalous results. Dialysis tubing acts as a partially permeable membrane and it can be used to represent a model cell to investigate osmosis. Plan an investigation to find out how different concentrations of sugar solutions affect the movement of water into or out of dialysis tubing. So what is our independent variable going to be? What are we changing? Is the concentrations of sugar solution Let's give a range, e.g. zero mole, what about our dependent variable, what are we measuring, the volume of water remaining in the dialysis tubing. Let's add a detail here, use a measuring cylinder to determine this. Next up, we want our control variables. What are we keeping the same? The starting volume of water inside the dialysis tubing. the temperature, the time the tubing's left for. Remember, we always want to repeat where goggles. Nautiluses are a genus of marine animals that live in shells. Figure 2.1 is a photograph of a Nautilus shell. Make a large drawing of the shell shown in figure 2.1. I really hate this drawing part. Let's show those important stripes. So hard if you can't draw like me. And they want the hole being made visible. That is dreadful. Line AB represents the width of the Natalia shell. Measure the length of line AB. So you're measuring the length of that line accurately with your ruler. You should find that it's 80 millimetres. The actual width of the shell is 130 millimetres. Calculate the magnification using this equation. We'll steal that equation. Remember, we have to give our answer to two significant figure. So the length of the line was 80. The actual width of the shell we've been told is 130. Pop that into your calculator and you get a value of 0. 6.2 to two significant figures. Figure 2.2 shows a fossilised Natalia shell. Describe one visible similarity and one visible difference between the Natalia shell shown in figure 2.1 and the fossilised one. So the similarity is that they both have a spiral shape. So what's the major difference? So it's a say what you see really. The picture above shows a smooth Notorious shell, whereas the fossil shows it much rougher.
Our population of one species of Notorious was studied. The widths of the Notorious shells were measured and recorded. Here are the results. Plot a histogram on the grid of the data shown in table 2.1. Let's add a few extra columns on this table in order to begin our histogram. The first one will be for the class width. Let's look at the range of numbers here. And actually, as you look down, it's 10 for each. And then the frequency density is calculated by doing the frequency divided by the class width. So we're taking these numbers and dividing them by the class width. Let's draw our axes now. On the y-axis, it's frequency density. And then on the x-axis, it's the width of shell in millimeters. Pick some sensible scales now. So frequency density ranges from 0.8 to 13.8. I'm going up in twos. That fits really nicely. Width of shell starts at 101 and goes up to 150. Let's shrink that scale. And now we can plot the bars of our histogram. I'm gonna to struggle to plot this entirely accurately using my iPad. But you'll see a rough approximation as to how I'm going about it. So now I'm plotting this set of points. Using the information in your graph, describe the results of this study. We can see that initially, as the width of the shell increases, the number of shells at that width increases. But then we can see it begins to decrease. What's the most common shell width? Well, it's from 121 millimeters to 130. What about the least common? That's 101 to 110, but we only need two separate points here. The study measured the width of 350 shells, suggests why such a large number of shells are measured. You always want a very large sample size in order to avoid bias, so skewed results. Using the data in Table 1, calculate the percentage of the population of nautiluses that have shells that are wider than 130 millimetres, give your answer to 1 dp. So we're interested in these two rows. So effectively, you want to add up these two numbers and put that number over the total number of shells. So that becomes 120 over 350 times it by 100. To one decimal place, our answer is 34.3. The notorious feeds on fish, which are an important source of protein, state the name of the test for protein and give the result a positive test. You need to use bioarray reagent. And if protein is present, it should turn purple.